The Second Realm Book on Strategy By Smuggler and XYZ Published by Liberty Under Attack Publications Narrated by Silas S. Soul Forward A common thread throughout anarchism and or libertarianism is the eventual arrival at some utopian, free society. The idea is that if, quote-unquote, we focus, quote-unquote, our efforts on educating individuals on economics, morality, history, etc., Quote unquote, we can hit critical mass, abolish the state, and live happily ever after. While this quote unquote, free world is a pipe dream, it doesn't mean that self liberators can't set up pockets of freedom in the here and now, despite the existence of the state. These respites from first realm tyranny are called second realms. In second realm, book on strategy, smuggler and XYZ build upon the framework laid by the likes of Samuel Edward Konkin III, Hakim Bey, and many anonymous cyberpunks. Agora's temporary and or permanent autonomous zones, digital freedom and or privacy, respectively. But the truly unique thing these authors were able to formulate was the merging of the physical and digital realms. Have you ever been to a freedom festival? Visited a deep web IRC chat? Used I2P? The Internet Invisibility Project? If so, you've seen firsthand the beauty and freedom found within these protected spaces. But you might want to start thinking bigger. Herein, the authors begin by discussing the underlying philosophy and the motivation for this particular freedom strategy. Terms are defined and elaborated upon. They tell you how to practically create second realms everywhere. You'll learn about high and low tech tools that can be used to maintain these realms going into the future. How to facilitate trade between the two realms and more. I'd like to provide one disclaimer before turning you over to this book on strategy, though. It's likely that you are already an anarchist looking for solutions. If that's the case, I sincerely believe you will find value in what you are about to read. If not, however, I would highly recommend beginning your anarchist adventure elsewhere. This is not designed to be an introductory book. In summation, crypto anarchy has delivered, quote unquote, us the tools necessary to build second realms in cyberspace. While that is a great feat for many reasons, it's important to remember that human beings are social creatures, and many individuals long for interaction in physical space and time. Smuggler, XYZ, and their predecessors have given, quote unquote, us a great starting point. It's time to start building. Shane Radliff, December 2018, The Vanu Podcast. Chapter 1 Crypto-anarchy, tradecraft, 
Taz and Counterculture. This is a booklet for people in search for liberty and who subscribe to a philosophy of personal, civil, and economic liberty through the absence of government in their lives, along with the presence of strong property rights. Among the varying philosophies that hold this view, the most noted is probably that of anarcho-capitalism, of both the Rothbardian and the Friedmanite flavor. The authors of this booklet subscribe to the former, and it is that perspective that should be taken into account to take the most value from this text. Thanks to Thomas C. May, Hakeem Bey, Murray Rothbard, J. Neil Shulman, and Samuel Edward Konkin III for inspiration and ideas to build on. We also thank the free and unashamed, for asking us to write down our thoughts and for supporting us in doing so. While you remain a mystery to us, you seem to be a good mystery. About the Authors This book was written by Smuggler at staff.anarplex.net and XYZ. We are the sole people responsible. These are our thoughts. If this book helped you, gave you pleasure, or just new things to think about, please say thank you by sending us some Bitcoin. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Motivation Anyone subscribing to a radical philosophy of liberty must face the pressing question of how to progress from our current condition of insufficient liberty to a society where individual liberty is respected. Several strategies for this change have been proposed, ranging from political participation educating and convincing the masses, civil disobedience, secession, and counter-economics, to outright revolution. While these proposals all have some interesting aspects, they are very often naive or poorly informed as to what really shapes society. The fundamental flaw to most of these strategies, with a slight exception in the theory of counter-economics, is the reliance on mass change of social, cultural, and economic structures and people in general. It has often been overlooked by voluntarists that collective thinking dominates many of our personal decision-making processes, which is why most of these strategies err by the fallacy of big numbers. By this term, we mean the belief that we must wait for progress until a large number of people rally to the support of our cause. We disagree, and we think that waiting has been a mistake and often chosen for the purpose of avoiding risks. We wish to minimize risk, but not to the point of inaction. Armies of supporters are however not to be expected. The reason for this should be accessible to economists and psychologists alike. Both production and parasitism are natural human strategies to satisfy personal desires. Both strategies appear naturally and are present within most people, with the exceptions of idealists and moralists on one hand and outright sociopaths on the other. Both strategies can easily be seen in modern life 
with parasitism becoming more profitable with every political intervention. Our current redistributive society moves property from producers to parasites, as well as shifting decisions from the individual to the ruler. The ruler, of course, is held above all personal responsibility, recourse, or personal risk. A surprisingly large number of people in modern societies are in favor of the redistribution of property, sometimes knowingly and sometimes merely because they regard the rules of the game more than the morals of the game. They see redistribution as the way of the world and work to get their share. Parasitism, where enforced by government, is easier than working. It provides a comparable level of consumption for less effort. In addition, it removes hundreds of daily decisions from an individual, along with the bad feelings of facing mistakes. It is sadly a truism that most people only want the freedom to be comfortable. Libertarian class theory describes two classes of people in society. Those that pay more taxes than they consume of public services, and those that consume more public services than they pay taxes. That is, taxpayers and tax feeders. What is underappreciated is the size of the second group. In most developing countries, tax feeders make up far more than a third of the employed, from direct bureaucrats to industries living off public money or regulation. In many developed countries, tax feeders have approached or passed 50%. The massive creation of fiat currency has allowed governments to keep this unsustainable game going. So far. Millions of people profit from this arrangement and will fight to keep it going to the last moment. If one combines only these two motives for intervening government, redistribution of property, and shifting of decisions, an easy majority of people profit from the existence of such an institution. There are, however, additional motives for the existence of the state as a social organization. One is the identity-creating feeling of belonging to something, a natural and not always negative motivator for humans. This is regularly exploited by the state to assure support and to limit dissent. Another motive is the perception of risks and lost opportunities from a change from the current status quo to a new society solely based on voluntary interaction, contract, and optional law. People feel comfort in the current arrangement and don't want to endure the strain of adapting to a new situation. This is understandable. The reflexive questions that are instantly asked are ones like these. Who will care for the sick, the old, the children, the environment? Who will build the roads, maintain security, license the doctors, and make sure the trains will be on time. These questions are often brushed away with a correct, but superficial, reply of the market. However, this reply is not sufficient. The market does not take care of anything. It is merely a system of interaction and exchange. 
people find solutions to human problems. Entrepreneurs spend time and effort to find solutions others will be willing to trade for, and, if they are correct, profit thereby. Without new supplies to these services, which are generally forbidden by force under the current regimes, the perception of risk cannot be sufficiently countered. Certainly not for someone who is agitatedly asking the question so that the frightening possibility of a new human arrangement may be quickly dismissed. The third motive against a change to a voluntary society is the perceived cost of change itself. Aside from adapting to new ways of living, any change will find resistance and risk of failure, ranging from the loss of money or time to losing life or liberty itself. Very few people are willing to take these risks, and many would be needed to achieve any meaningful change in an entire society. After all, liberty is costly. The reasonable conclusion, then, is to cease hoping for large numbers of supporters and instead to focus on strategies that make individual liberty possible in the current situation. But, while we have ceased hoping for massive events to bring liberty to us, we have not given up hope for liberty. We have merely faced the fact that we'll have to build it brick by brick for ourselves without waiting for support or permission. Fortunately, these methods allow us to model a voluntary society for those less willing to take the risks, so that a formally intellectual concept can be shown to them in real life, here and now, to see and feel with no waiting. This does not require many like-minded people. The truth is that waiting for consent keeps us from acting. And acting allows us to test and modify our theories in the real world which is the only way they will ever reach their most useful forms. Another grave error is often found in the strategic thinking of anarcho-capitalists and voluntarists. Since anarcho-capitalism is fundamentally an individual philosophy, its adherents are usually staunchly opposed to any notion of collectivism. While in general they are correct, they miss important distinctions in their vehemence. Collectivism's main tenet is the submission of the individual to the collective, without the individual's express consent. This includes as much as the individual stepping back, or even being scapegoated, for the good of the collective, and the identity of the individual being described chiefly through the terms of the group. It is critical to emphasize two important aspects of this concept. First, any membership in a collective does not depend on the express decision of the individual member. He is either forced to be part of it or at least he is forced to stay part of it after joining. Second, the identity aspects of a collective are irrelevant in almost all meaningful situations, or simply superficial beyond meaning. We have all seen this in so many forms that it hardly needs a great deal of explanation. What is sometimes underappreciated however, is the possibility of collective action by consent. Voluntarists and like-minded people have often gone too far in throwing out any kind of social grouping, 
especially those with the ability to establish identity or culture. It has often been overlooked that humans often seek out terms and groups that provide them with a means of belonging to something, as well as being someone. Not by some magical means of the group itself, but because the group is composed of humans that already belong or are. Group relationships provide a base for forming a culture of common symbols, meanings, ethics, and relationships. These are useful, and maybe even necessary, for human social interaction and life. Furthermore, these groups can form larger societies that provide common institutions, reflect relationships, and simplify interdependencies and allegiances. This leads to increased stability and efficiency of interaction, trade, and communication, as well as positive identity establishing functions and more coherent relationships with people outside this society. It must be emphasized, however, that these positive functions of society can only be achieved in groups of voluntary, individually consenting, associations with clear and easy exit options. The useful functions of such groups of voluntary associations nourish a culture of liberty, and the forming of a society of free people increases the attractiveness of anarcho-capitalism by decreasing its image of coldness, providing a common narrative, and establishing a base for voluntary loyalty and allegiance. These positive aspects open new options to solve some of the problems we face. Enforcement of agreements, streamlining of trust relationships, reputation, and mutual aid, just to name a few. By learning from methods found in many primitive, anarchistic societies. Conclusion A strategy for the implementation of liberty must be built on three ideas. 1. It is necessary to achieve individual liberty in all aspects. Economical, personal, and civil, with only a very small subset of the total population. Liberty should be assumed to be a minority position that is actively opposed by some and passively ignored by most. If it ever becomes more, we'll have no trouble adapting. 2. All notions of the homogeneity of society change of mainstream opinion, and universal integrity of a population must be abandoned. 3. We must form a culture and society of liberty, or at least take first steps towards this goal and nourish attempts to accomplish a cultural secession from the mainstream society that allows us to form and protect institutions of social interaction and relationships. End of chapter 2